One night, King Nebuchadnezzar of ancient Babylon had a dream. And the dream left him terrified and in a cold sweat. It was unlike any dream that he had ever dreamed. It was a dream that he sensed carried with it great significance, tremendous weight, the breadth and the scope of it. And so that when he awoke from this dream, he called the sorcerers and the magicians and those in ancient Babylon whose job it was as experts to unravel this dream and what it meant. It was a dream that, that God had given to him, but he was looking for their help. And, and uh, he was frustrated because he couldn't remember what he had dreamed. And that compounded more of the anxiety, not only the sense of the weightiness of it, but he couldn't remember it. So I would imagine that the conversation that took place with his experts was that he said, you know, I have just had a dream that I sense was just epic in its proportions, in its breadth and in its depth. There's something so significant about it, but I can't remember what I have dreamed. And so he gave them this charge. He demanded from them that they tell him the dream that he had forgotten. And then beyond that, to tell him the meaning of the dream. And he was so serious about this. And he was so disturbed by what he had dreamed that if they did not fulfill what he had commanded them, they would be executed. Well, they replied to him. They said, well, no one on earth can make known what you request. What you are asking of us is so difficult that only the gods would know such secrets. Well, on their scheduled execution, the Hebrew Daniel was notified. He must have been like an apprentice at this time. He wasn't part of this original conversation, but he was notified, and he would have been among those that was going to be scheduled to be executed even though he hadn't been a part of that conversation. So he asked for an audience with the king. And coming before King Nebuchadnezzar, he asked that he would, if he could be given some time to discover what the sorcerers could not tell him. And that night he had a dream. And it was the identical dream that Nebuchadnezzar had had And he was also given the secret meaning of the dream. That is described in the Bible in Daniel chapter 2. And here is what he dreamed and also the meaning of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar was shown a preview of the future. He was shown something only God knows. Only God knows what will happen tomorrow. He was showing him the big picture. And in this big picture were four kingdoms that would rise and that would fall. And each of these four kingdoms was succeeded by a kingdom that was inferior to the one before. So they were decreasing in their, in their well, we would say in, in their um, significance, perhaps. But certainly they... They had this in common. They, each of them dominated over Israel and the Jews, these Gentile kingdoms. And the four kingdoms were Babylon, the first, Persia following, which was inferior to Babylon. And then Greece, under Alexander the Great, was actually inferior to Persia. And finally, the Roman Empire. And these four kingdoms, kingdoms were pictured in Nebuchadnezzar's dream as a colossal statue, tall, dazzling, terrifying, and beginning with the head, the head being made of gold and representing Babylon, each lower portion of this statue was different in the quality of the metal and that it was made of. It was an inferior metal. And then finally, to the feet of this statue, which was mixed between iron and fired clay. 
And, and, uh, and so it was feet that were both strong, but very unstable, fragile, easily broken up. Now, in our own day, these kingdoms could be represented by actual nations today that exist in those regions, in, those, in that geography. And it would be Iran and Iraq and Syria and Turkey being the Rome, the eastern part of the Roman Empire with Constantinople, which was the capital, which today is Istanbul. And what's interesting is that they also have this common thing and that it was a, a hatred against the Jewish people and a desire to do actually not just dominate but just destroy Israel. Now, you covered these ancient empires in your world history high school courses. And uh, maybe you didn't really pay attention to it, but you did cover it. And when you, but when we come to the feet, the feet is still future. That wasn't found in your, in your textbooks. And it's something that will arise. The feet seem to include, it seems to include those that would be before, because they're all part of this statue, but also a coalition of, 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 of nations or empires or kingdoms, if you will, that are fragile, could be easily fractured, even though there is a, a coalition there. What's interesting is today, Turkey's president, Erdogan, has a desire to restore what was called the Ottoman Empire, which ruled that portion of the world for centuries, but was dissolved in 1918. But it's his desire to bring together a coalition of nations, Muslim nations, and, and this formation actually could take place if he, if he has the willpower to do it. He certainly has an army. It's the largest there in that area. And, uh, and man, he's got this idea, this big idea of reviving, resurrecting, the Ottoman Empire, which would include these four kingdoms and then, and then introduce others that could easily be ten kingdoms representing the, the ten toes. Very easy. And it could actually happen in our lifetime if he, if he gets what he wants and, and, and his designs. The Ottoman Empire would be a Muslim coalition. Now, in... Nebuchadnezzar's dream, when you're talking about those four kingdoms, it didn't end with just those four kingdoms because something more terrifying appeared in his dream. And it was the appearance of a stone. Daniel 2, 34 describes a stone that appeared that struck the feet of this statue, feet that don't exist today. But the feet of the statue struck the, the feet of that statue and crushed them, and the entire statue disintegrated and turned to dust and was blown away by the wind. And there was no trace left of it. It was completely annihilated. And then the stone enlarged and became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. And this was his, his dream. So that in the end, the only kingdom that was left standing was the stone that had annihilated the rest and become a great mountain and filled the earth. And Daniel provided the meaning of this, which is what we want. What are we looking at here? And he provided the meaning of the stone, Daniel 2.44. In the days of those kings, the God of the heavens will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end but will itself 
endure forever. This is an outline of future events and future kingdoms and nations. And the day is coming when only one kingdom will be left standing and it will remain for eternity. Now, those who have bowed in submission to that king who is over that kingdom are the ones who will be among those who survive and remain for eternity and be a part of that. So you see how important it is to understand not only who that king is, but to be submitted to him and to, and to make sure that you have allied yourself with him. Because otherwise you turn to dust, blown away by the wind. What's interesting is that Jesus Christ himself um, would, describes himself as a, st a stone. But the stone in reference there is a stone that the builders rejected and cast aside because they thought it was either inferior or that it was useless. And he says, I'm the stone that the builders cast aside but have become, has become the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone in Matthew 21, 42. Later on in the book of Daniel is another prophecy that carries this theme of an eternal kingdom, and it's referenced with a, a person called the Son of Man. Son of Man is a, a name that Jesus would most often use of himself. And this says about the Son of Man, he, will, he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. There we go with the kingdom again. Given a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Again, we come to this theme, eternal, lasting dominion. In the New Testament, it's kind of summarized in Ephesians 1.10, where it, put, it puts it like this, and this is the plan. This is the plan. This is the big plan. At the right time, God will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. You know, people, it is so easy to lose sight of this important truth and to become enmeshed in some of the news stories of the day that seem to foment anxiety and unrest and people that are unsettled. Because we live in a day where there are kingdoms. And these kingdoms are mentioned in the news all the time. We live in one of them, by the way. But there are others around the globe. China, Russia, the European Union. We could throw Great Britain in there too. And certainly those in the Middle East like Iran and Turkey, or Iran and Turkey. And all of these kingdoms, they... They have economic ambitions. They have armies, huge armies, especially some of those kingdoms. And they want to wield global power and influence. And people get nervous when they read stories of what's going on, and, and even like North Korea, you know, and a kind of a crazy guy that's leading that country. And we wonder, how is this all going to play itself out? And we get unsettled because we think of how we're going to fit into it. And our grandchildren, we're thinking like that, especially if you're in my age bracket. And we think about this. And, and we understand that, that these things unsettle us. But we, never, we cannot lose sight of this important truth that God has already declared and the important question before us is, is Jesus Christ your king? Because in the end, his is the only king kingdom that's going to be left standing. And he's the stone that will destroy and annihilate the rest of them. You have to have him as your king. And in our day and perhaps even generations to come, I don't know, 
the, the, the timeline. Nobody knows the timeline of God, but empires will rise and they will fall. And perhaps in our lifetime, we will see some of that. But Jesus is the one who said, my kingdom is not of this world. That's important because it doesn't originate here. It doesn't have any kind of economic base. It doesn't have a standing army. The kingdom of Jesus Christ does not have a seat at the United Nations. It's, for the most part, an invisible kingdom. But it is nevertheless very real. And it is the kingdom that will be the only king, kingdom that is left standing in the end. And one day, that stone will turn to dust and crush all of the other kingdoms, and it will fill the earth. And the road to that future passes right through the chapter that I read earlier in 2 Samuel 7. Because this road passes through a particular verse. Eventually, Jesus Christ would be born and he was called the son of David. And the key verse in all of this is verse 16 of chapter 7 where it says, David, your house and kingdom will endure before me forever. There you see, we're coming to this enduring forever again theme. And your throne will be established forever. Well, whose dynasty is that? Well, it's the Son of Man's dynasty. When Jesus Christ was born, he was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Because all of the other kings that were born after David, I mean, for the most part, except for just a, a minority, they were all wicked, wicked men. They were terrible. Certainly, that's not going to be those from those, a kingdom that would last forever. It would have to be somebody other than that kind of caliper. And it was one who was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Magi came to worship him as an infant king. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt in fulfillment of a prophecy about the display of the king. And the hosannas were shouted, even though the people probably had no idea what, what there was really going on there and how they were fulfilling prophecy. And in Revelation 19, Jesus is pictured riding on a white horse at his return. And his name written on his, his garment was King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, when I talk about these kinds of things, kingdoms and, you know, lasting forever, and, you know, it feels so distant and so remote to the relevancy of this modern world. And it almost feels like, you know, what does this have to do with the daily grind that I go through, other than interesting information that you're preaching about? What difference does this make, and how does this affect my weekly demands? I'm thinking like a teenager, for instance, who's thinking about the course of his or her life and wondering, you know, what am I going to do with my life and with the future? Does, does the kingdom of God enter the thoughts of that young person as though it's important to them? And maybe you're raising a family and you're, you're thinking primarily about how do I raise my kids and get them to a place of being respectable adults? Yet what place does the kingdom of God have in your family life? Or the trials that collide with us and the experience of difficulty and the problems and suffering and maybe prolonged hardship. And we ask the question, well, where does the kingdom of God fit into all this? How does it help us through these periods? Now, what I want to do in the few moments that are remaining is to help you see the importance of all of this and that everything I have been talking about has great relevance to our lives, because the fact of the matter is, it directly relates to how we should be thinking and how we should be living. 
We ought to have the kingdom of God on our minds all the time. Isn't that what Jesus said in, in Matthew 6? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What did he mean by that? He said that, that should dominate your thinking. It should be part of how you plan for your life and for your future. How you process where you fit into life and life itself and what's going on around us and how you watch the news and all of these things. It, it, it serves us today. Now, there are three great realities that I'll, I'll do my best to just drop into your mind here in the next few moments about the kingdom. And the first of these is that there is another kingdom here. It's the kingdom of Satan. And it's very real, too, albeit invisible. But the stranglehold of Satan's rule over you has been crushed by Jesus Christ. And he is the prince over a kingdom. And his kingdom is very present. In fact, in many ways, he's the one who is at the steering wheel of what's going on in those nations of the world, including our own country, by the way. And it has been behind the wheel for a long, long time. And it certainly is very, very active. On the day when the serpent Satan showed up in the Garden of Eden, he has destroyed everything he has touched. He came to Adam and Eve with a lie, and the lie was that God is not good, that he is withholding from you something that would make your life more fulfilling, and you could be like him, you could be like God, and that he is not good to you. And they bought that lie, bought into it, and as a result of that, they disobeyed God, and with their sin brought chaos and destruction and death and, and, uh, into this world. And it plunged this world into the mess that we see it today. Satan rules over a kingdom that seeks to steal and kill and to destroy. I think a couple of weeks ago I, I made mention that Larry King died. And um, I'm a boomer, so see, I kind of grew up with Larry. And uh, late night radio, he would be interviewing. I'd listen to that. And then he had this TV show. You know, he interviewed a lot of Christians over the years. But never once did he seriously give the gospel any consideration. You know why? Because he couldn't reconcile a loving God and the suffering that he saw in the world. But Mr. King, if you had only acknowledged and recognized Genesis 3 where the introduction of sin into the world by the disobedience of Adam and Eve and the lies of the serpent, then you would understand why the world is in the condition. God still remains good and righteous and perfect and all-powerful, but it's the fall that explains the mess that we see around us. Well, that mess is real. And on the day when Adam and Eve sinned, God gave them a promise. The promise was, I'm going to send a serpent crusher. And that serpent crusher was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. That serpent crusher would restore creation to its original perfection. He would reverse the damage caused by sin, and he would reclaim what was stolen by Satan. And Genesis 3.15, the first hint of this big, and this is one of those big picture verses, big picture verses. And, and, uh, and, and God said to the serpent, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head that is her offspring, a designated person, a serpent crusher, will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Vaughn Roberts uh, makes an observation and says, you know, it, from that moment on in, when you come to Genesis 3.15, the third chapter in the Bible, 
from there on, you are looking in the scripture and you are wondering who this serpent crusher is going to be. You're on the search. Who is he? Who is he? And we, even when we come to, to 2 Samuel 7 in this prophecy and this promise that was given to David, you know, he's saying, I wonder, I wonder if this has something to do with the serpent crusher. And you know what? It does. It does. It carries the storyline forward. This promise that is among, among David's uh, descendants, there would be one who would come, who would crush Satan. And Jesus Christ was sent by God to fulfill this promise given to Adam and Eve. And he shattered and he crushed the dominion, the rule, the authority that Satan had over this world that took place there at the, at the fall. And Jesus did it in such an unlikely way. He did it through his death on the cross, a place of humiliation and shame and, and what looked like a failure, like this is a miserable end, was in fact a substitute sacrifice on our behalf for our sins and so the wrath of God that should have been poured out on us was poured out on him. And so the sin of Adam and Eve was actually cared for at the cross. I mean, why did God not destroy Adam and Eve in chapter 3 of Genesis? It's just annihilate them right there. It's because on what basis did he forgive them? on the basis of what would take place at the cross. Looking forward to the death of Jesus Christ in the substitute sacrifice. So he was our substitute as well as Adam and Eve's substitute. And Satan struck the heel of Jesus. But he rose again on the third day. But Jesus struck the head of Satan. And it was a death blow crushing his hold and his dominion over mankind and over this, this world. So my point is that no longer do we have to be victims of Satan and of his lies and his dominion. No longer do we need to live in darkness and self-destruction. No longer do we need to follow him to his ultimate end, and that is the lake of fire. We don't have to do that. The message is about Jesus Christ who sets us free from that. Satan will today use things that are respectable in order to lure people along his pathway to, to destruction. He uses religion, respectable religion. People who look at themselves and they say, well, I've never sinned. Come on. I'm a good person. You know, I go to church. I'm part of the council. I'm part of those things that really matter and try to make a difference for good in this life. And, and, and they, so they see themselves as people that are outside of those who are sinners. They I mean, don't call me that. But the truth of the matter is that they bought into a lie. None of that is going to save them when they stand before God. And the truth is, is that only Jesus Christ is our hope. Jesus is the one who is the serpent crusher. And he's the only one who will be left standing on that final day and those who are accompanying him, who are with him. And they will not be thrown into the lake of fire as will the rest. Satan's defeat and his death sentence is pictured for us in the book of Colossians. Listen to this. This is really good doctrine, by the way. This is sound doctrine. You were dead because of your sins then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the, the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Have you been a victim of Satan's web of lies? Have you bought into this where you think that somehow through your own effort and through your whatever you 
consider a good life and following the golden rule. You think that all of this is going to somehow achieve a right standing before God and you can do this? You've bought into a pack of lies. That's not going to help you at all. The only person who can help you is Jesus Christ, the serpent crusher. Are you enslaved to the fear of death? Are you reaping the consequences of having bought into Satan's lies? Well, you know, the reality is that even those who are trying to live an upright moral life, they never can get rid of the guilt. I still feel guilty. You know why? Because you are. It's only Christ that can remove that feeling. I don't live with the feeling of guilt. I can honestly tell you that. Why? Because it was all taken care of by Christ. He took that. He paid the penalty of my sin. It has been cared for in full. I don't feel guilty at all. Jesus, I made, I made peace with God through Jesus Christ. And so can you. So can you. You can break free of, his, of Satan's dominion and his domination over you. And Jesus Christ made that possible. But you say, well, how do I do that? Well, listen to this. This brings me to the next reality. That only those who are born again will see the kingdom of God. This is a message that is absent in so many pulpits today. We've got preachers today who are very eager to preach about the current events. They, they basically form their sermon ideas and topics from the front page of the newspaper. It drives what they're going to talk about. Even one that I listened to this week that was from this region, and somehow, some way, I ended up on the church website and hit, I wonder what he preaches about. And he was in the New Testament in one of the Gospels, and and he, and he, and he re referenced what he was, you know, the, the, the passage. And then was said, and I was going to talk about this topic. I'm not going to tell you what it was, but it's been one in the news for the last six months. And, and I thought to myself, well, that's got nothing to do with the passage that you were going to, re that you just referenced. How can you do that? But that was, he seriously was going to, and then went off into another direction. They had nothing to do with the passage at all. And this is the diet. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, There is a day coming when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. But because of their own desires, they will multiply teachers for themselves who will who, because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. Well, what they want to hear and what they should hear are two different things because what they should be hearing, what they must hear is John 3.3. 3. Jesus replied, I tell you, unless someone is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God of God. You can't see it. You're shut out. You have no place in the kingdom of God. You can't even see it now. It's not even on your radar. As religious as you are, you have a form of godliness without the power. So what do we do? We repent. We repent of trying to live independent of God and we submit to Jesus and we get rid of the pride because that's what's been holding so many back is that because of their pride, they refuse to bend their knee before the king and submit their lives to him and believe that Jesus Christ died for their sin and that he himself on their behalf has made peace with God. Which brings me to the final reality about the kingdom and that is if Jesus Christ is your king today, if you are among the citizens of the kingdom of, of God and you're in that company who is born again, if that describes you, then let your life display Jesus as your king and be proud of it. 
Be proud of it. That's a proper kind of pride. Bold in it. Make every effort that your life be a godly life. You make the effort to do this. Make every effort. And this requires radical decisions many times of putting away sinful habits and and corrupting influences and said, I'm going to get rid of that. Do you know that I have had to actually tell Christians, Christians now, I'm talking to, I've actually had to tell them, do you know what? My, my allegiance and my loyalty belongs to Jesus Christ. Ahead of every other person or cause or issue or religious idea out there. I mean, I don't want to make you mad and I don't want to offend you, but do you understand that Jesus is my king? Do you get that? He is my king. He is my king. And not where you want me to preach, or what you want me to say, or my views. You want my views to align with your views. Well, I'm sorry, but my views are going to align with my king because my marching orders come from him. I'm accountable to him. I'm not accountable to you. And so as a result of that, my speech, my sermons, my ethics, all of this is from my king. And if it rubs the wrong way, then that's the cost. I have to be willing to bear that. Jesus Christ is my king. And you know what? It makes life really less complicated. You know, I I don't start with the culture. I don't start with popular opinion. I start with my king's handbook, the Bible. And I say, well, what does it say? Because then I don't get enmeshed in all the other ideas and, you know, kind of meandering through the labyrinth. I don't need to do that. Say, well, this is what my king says, you know, right there. You know, it's, it's not really hard to understand. So this, this is my mar- these are my marching orders. They come from him. And there will be a day when the only kingdom left standing is the kingdom of God and his word. And the rest of it will return to dust. It will all be crushed by the stone and it will be blown away. Could it be that this kingdom of God is going to be shown and revealed to the world within our lifetime? It's possible. It's possible that that stone will crush the other kingdoms. Maybe not within my lifetime, I don't know, but maybe in my kids' or my grandchildren's lifetime, I don't know. But there's a lot of things happening that say, wow, you know, it looks like the stone that's going to crush these other kingdoms is really right there at the door. And it's really quite possible that final kingdom will arise. Well, let me wrap it all up by by uh, mentioning the the final final book of of the Bible, Revelation, where it describes this about that kingdom. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The kingdom of the world. Russia, China, Iran, United States of America. All of it has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So I'm not going to get all anxious about what's going on in Russia. (laughs) For what? I belong to a different kingdom. A kingdom that in the end is the only one going to be left standing. And it's not the United States. I love my country but my allegiance, first and foremost, and I hope you understand this, is to my Lord and Savior. That's my first allegiance, and everything else comes way down here. And that ought to be true for every believer. Well, let's go before God in prayer.
Our Father, we pray that you might help us to align our thinking uh, in accordance with what you have shown us. And that means that we will probably have to do some alterations along the way. And uh, God, I pray that, uh, that we would be bold in an age where it seems like everybody wants to melt into the popular opinions and not be known as rocking the boat. God, I pray that you would help us as believers, born-again Christians, to take a bold and a proud stance with our King and to do so because in the end, we know, we know that it will be the only kingdom that is left standing. In Jesus' name.